Um, this, uh, this talk is part of the IT for Art seminar in May, taking place in the English National Opera. The talk, the, the, this talk is about engaging the unusual suspects in the audience and is a follow-on from a previous presentation made in our November seminar uh, by Jackie Hay, who is a consultant with Maurice Hargreaves McIntyre, and it's about very interesting things going on in the time side. Uh, the views expressed by the speakers are their own, and neither their employers nor the Worshipful Company of Information Technologies and its subsidiaries are responsible for them. With that, over to you, Jack. Thank you very Thank much. Thanks so much. As Mark said, my name is Jackie Hay. I work for Morris Hargreaves McIntyre. We're a um, creative research and strategy agency specialising in the arts. We have offices in Manchester, London, Auckland and Sydney. And uh, we work with both performing arts and, and museums and galleries and heritage sectors. It's just a very tiny uh, representation of some of our current clients around the world. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about a project called The Unusual Suspects, which is all about engaging, what I'll talk to you about in a moment, The Unusual Suspects in your audience. So I just want to check, uh, I came and gave a presentation in November about this project. How many people in the audience were here then? I know that there's Jo and Mary, a few of you. Okay, so I'm going to go through the background of that project. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the results. And I just want to thank um, IT for Arts for inviting me back to talk about the results of the project. So the project is an R&D project. Um, <coughs> and as arts organisations, we've become really expert at marketing and audience development, but we tend to focus on those that we know, our core audience, and hope that they'll come back again and again. Uh, but what we don't tend to focus on as much, although Claire mentioned it earlier and it was great to see that she was thinking about her potential audience, are our infrequent attenders, our lapsed audience members, or perhaps those who have actually never been to our venue at all, or maybe never engaged with our art form. So we talk about the usual suspects, our core attenders, and this project is focusing on the unusual suspects, those that we don't engage with that frequently. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the project, uh, we're not actually working just with one organisation, we're working with nine, and the idea is that they share all of their audience data. This is a consortium in uh, Newcastle Gateshead that have been working together for about 10 years. Uh, they share lots of things, uh, they do uh, joint marketing and audience development projects, but one of the things that they've never done up until this point is to share their audience data. Uh, the project overall is a three-year project, but the first year of the project is funded by the Digital R&D Fund for the Arts, which is made up of NESTA, the Arts Council England, and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So some of the things that we wanted to address in this pilot project was, can we create a commonwealth where we pull all of our shared audience data to unlock the potential for engaged audiences? So if we put all of our data together, can we try and ensure that we can engage um, those who don't come to our organisations, make sure that there's crossover and engage uh, our infrequent attenders? By, using, by strategically using segmentation and profiling insight, can we increase engagement with our audiences? And well, if we are applying audience development and marketing strategies and tactics, which are the things that really resonate with audiences and which are those things that don't? So everything that we do in this project is effectively an experiment and we're testing again and again to see what works and what doesn't. So these are some of the objectives of the project. Can we demonstrate um, that the effective use of culture segments and levels of engagement and using the insight from that can help us build deeper relationships with our audiences? Can we show that collaboration uh, is effective and efficient? And we really want to build the capability of all of the partners in the um, project. And then at the end, part of, the, uh, part of what we need to do uh, both for the um, NESTA um, part of the project, but also what we want to do is to show which audience development and marketing strategies 
works by um, publishing case studies, but also opening up all of the things that we've created to the rest of the sector if they would like to use them. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So um, when we talk about data insight, we've got quite a lot of data already uh, from, from the northeast. And as part of the project, we're using culture segments, which is a segmentation system that Morris Huggers and McIntyre developed specifically for the arts sector. It's been around for a number of years now. We had developed uh, segmentation systems for organisations like the National Trust and Tate. And after a while, we decided that rather than creating segmentation systems just for one organisation at a time, what would be really great is to pull all of that insight and develop a segmentation system that could be used for the entire sector so that we have a shared language and that people can use it as they choose. So I don't know if any of you have access to, um, any of you have access to the internet. You might want to uh, just check and see which culture segment you are. Uh, and we had a presentation earlier from Historic Royal Palaces and they use culture segments on a daily basis. They use it in their marketing, they use it in their interpretation, they use it in their retail and their catering, right across the organisation they use it really uh, strategically. So culture segments, uh, rather than being based on geodemographics, is based on psychographics. So what we do is we look at people's attitudes and their motivations so that we can understand what is it that might drive them to attend particular art forms or particular venues. And uh, we have named each of the, I won't go into too much detail about this, but we have named each of the segments, we've identified eight segments. We're not suggesting that there are only eight kinds of people in the world, but in order to make sense of um, the insight that we have, we've developed these eight segments, and they're each named for the role that art plays in their lives. So for example, essence, uh, you might imagine are people who believe that, in fact, a lot of you in this room will be essence. Uh, most of the people that I work with are uh, essence, uh, really believe that arts and culture are fundamental to their lives and that they couldn't live without them. Without them. Uh, they're very discerning, they're very spontaneous, they're very sophisticated in their taste in the arts and very independent in terms of the kinds of things that they will go to. I'm not going to go through all of them. I happen to be expression, and expression are also very confident in their own tastes, um, and they're very creative, but they are would just as easily go to something at the English National Opera as they would to a community event. So they like to go to lots of different things. It's really great to have expression in your audience because they love to, they're very social and they love to tell people about, um, about things. And they're quite likely the people who will round up a whole bunch of their friends to come along to your event. So that just gives you a brief oversight um, of culture segments. But we're using culture segments as part of the project to try and be really targeted uh, in our, and strategic in our communications. And it really helps us to understand what might persuade people to come along to the particular events that we're marketing for. Uh, so as part of our um, information on culture segments, we have detailed pen portraits for each segment. And what that tells us is what the characteristics are for each segment, what their media tastes are, what their digital behaviour is, uh, what art forms they prefer, what art forms they don't prefer. Um, we also look at um, their propensity to donate, to volunteer. Um, we look at their levels, their average levels of spend and their average levels of attendance in a year. So there's quite a lot of detailed information in there. And so we're working with the arts organisations in the consortium to be really, really targeted in their activities. Um, and this is just a very brief slide to show you. Uh, this is something we've worked very closely with AKA, and they have developed these are, um, it's just a brief overview of how they target their messaging by segment. So, uh, we ha already have some information about the Northeast and what the culture segment split is, and you can see that it's quite different to um, the rest of the UK. And one of the things that we, I'll show you later on is what the split is for our data commonwealth and for these organisations. One of the other things, is, this is a model that we've developed um, with our research over the last kind of 20 years. Um, we have quite recently developed this model about levels of engagement. So it basically maps 
the um, visitor journey or the audience journey, um, but coming from the least engaged or potential attenders right through to people who are very confident explorers, highly engaged, to people who are givers of time and money. So we're using this as a baseline for our research. What we've done is we've gathered, um, and I'll show you this in a moment, we've gathered um, for people in the pro for the audience members in the project where they sit in this model and this in the journey of engagement and then what we'll do at the end of the project is we'll do that piece of research again and hopefully what we can show is that they have moved further along the engagement journey and are more engaged than they were before the project started. So I'm just going to go all of this through all of this quite quickly. So what we know from previous research uh, in the northwest is it's a really large untapped market of potential audiences. Um, we, and we also know, or at least we thought, that most people are in, who are arts attenders are already going to be on one of the organisations in the nine on their database. And so if we can then pull all of that data together, we can actually increase our access to audiences on a regular basis. One of the things that we talk about is um, trying to develop a shared market and not market share. For a lot of us in the arts, our job is to try and get people along to our later show or to our venue. And uh, many of us are really enlightened and also trying to encourage people to engage in our art form. But actually, our audience, we're competing um, not just with the theatre next door, but with um, with sports, with uh, cinema, with TV, like for anything in people's leisure time we're actually competing with. And so the future is to be thinking about a shared market rather than trying to defend a market share. And so that's one of the principles of our project, is trying to develop a shared market. We think there's huge potential for audience crossover once we've got all of the, um, all of the data together, so that in fact with our shared market we've got a much bigger reach in terms of our audiences. And obviously everybody has limited resources, no matter how big your organisation is, everybody has issues with limited resources. So if we pull everything together, we can be much more effective and efficient. So I'm just going to talk through about what the process was that we've gone through. So uh, we formed a consortium. And then we built a data warehouse, basically, to put all of the audience data that we had together. Now, when I talk about audience data, uh, we went for a very, very simple approach. So we're not talking about putting in ticketing history. What we're doing is talking about audience contact details so that we then can develop campaigns uh, to try and engage them. So we built a data warehouse, and it's very much just that, a warehouse where all of the data sits. Excuse me. Um, to show you this slide and it will help. So what happens is the data from each of the organisations, uh, all of the contact data that they have goes into what we were calling the dirty warehouse and each organisation's data sits in its own silo. So it's a shared warehouse but it sits in its own silo and there are very good reasons for that and they're mainly around privacy permissions which I'll talk to you about in a moment. And then what we did is we cleaned all the data, we deduped it, we took out deceased, and then we um, uh, augmented it. So we basically profiled that, and I'll talk to you in a moment about some of the data that we've captured about that. So the next step in the phase is to build an audience commonwealth. So effectively what we did is we took all that data and then we sent out invites to everybody in the database that we had, that all of the cleaned data, and invited them to join our commonwealth. Uh, we actually call the call mark in this particular instance the insider and we send out invitations to everybody saying we will send you uh, on a regular basis uh, offers and invites and um, special behind the scenes um, events um, that are personalised to you and to your tastes if you sign up to the insider. So from their perspective they were just signing up to get what they might consider to be offers from our perspective, effectively what they were doing is signing up and answering an audience survey. And that's what we call the audience commonwealth. So we've got the clean warehouse and here's the commonwealth here, where we're going to segment all of the data. 
Okay, so it's what we call the insider. And effectively, by answering that survey, which they saw as a lengthy sign-up form, we, we have their, um, their age, what their family profile is, what their level of engagement is in the model that I showed you before, what their culture segment is, whether they've been to any of the art forms in the past 12 months, whether they've been to any of the art forms in the past <coughs> three years, whether they would go to any of the art forms and the same for all of the venues. So we went and asked them, have you ever been? Would you be interested in going? So we've got a huge amount of data inside the insider. Uh, just very quickly, we decided that when we named it and when we created this brand, that it had to be very vanilla, basically, because you've got nine really iconic arts organisations in Newcastle, Bateshead, and we wanted to kind of preserve that and just make um, make the insider not too, not stand out too much. This is a, an example of our dashboard. I won't go into that uh, too much, but where you can see um, each organisation can go in and they can look at their data, they can work out um, what percentage of each culture segment they've got, they can say, I want to look at all of the members of the insider who have never been to my organisation before but would like to go and they can design a campaign based around that. So I'll just talk about some of the details. So um, some of you will be wondering about the privacy aspects. So when the data is in the warehouse before we've invited them to the insider, and this is why we keep the data in silos, because the data protection for each of the organisations, what their data policy is, is what um, matches those, those, um, those records. Once we have invited them to the Commonwealth, basically um, they have given us full consent. So in order to sign up and uh, join, and join the, co the Commonwealth or the Insider, they have to tick our terms and conditions. And those terms and conditions basically are very permissive in terms of what they allow the organisations to do, but they can opt out any time they like, and we express that very strongly so that they understand. We also did some research with um, <coughs> uh, people who had been to some of the organisations and tested the idea of how they would feel about the privacy issues. And what was really interesting in that research is that actually they said, if we chose to join the Insider, we would be fine about the privacy issues because we really trust the organisation that's inviting us. So the way the invitations worked is that each individual organisation invited all the people in their database to join the Insider, that makes sense to you. So it was really interesting that they had really high levels of trust with the arts organisations. So we're quite happy to sign um, the privacy policy that we had. And things like the privacy policy, which we spent quite a long time investigating and testing, all of that is available to anybody who wants to use it. So it's basically a part of our data commons. So if any of you are interested in looking at that privacy policy, let me know. Sometimes we talk about putting the R back in CRM. Uh, the relationship back in CRM and early on in the project we did think about the different kinds of the different ways into the project. We could have developed a really um, a really sophisticated plugin that basically was an API between all of the different uh, CRMs of each organisation um, to try and bridge that gap but in the end we decided that, that was just we just didn't have the budget and the time to do that which is why we went for the kind of warehouse idea. Um, so when we're talking about that, the R and CRM, we're talking about putting back the relationship, um, the missing relationship data, because sometimes it's quite tricky to build up a really strong profile of somebody based just on their postcode or three years of ticketing history, because we know that what people have been to in the past is not always an indicator of what they might go to in the future. So what we did is, as I mentioned, we clean segmented profi and profiled the data. And as I mentioned, we now know what their awareness is for the venues and for the art forms, their past attendance, and their future propensity to attend, um, and for the art form as well as for each venue. And we also know all of these things which I mentioned before. And we know what their culture segment is, and obviously we have a lot of insight into how to target uh, for each of those segments. Uh, one of the things that we're also building up a really good understanding of 
particularly through the insight from culture segments, is what their propensity would be to join an organisation or to volunteer or to donate. And for some organisations more than others, that's incredibly important. And so we've had some organisations do campaigns where they only target people who are prepared to join um, or donate their time or money. And all of the data that um, is in the warehouse and that has been cleaned uh, has gone back to the organisations and all of the data from the inside also goes back to the organisations so they get this profile for their membership. Uh, we, and again, as I said, we know their level of engagement and full consent with a kind of quite tight privacy lock. So the missing data is then shared between the venues and organisations always have full access to their own data. Um, and they have campaign access to the insider so they can go in and they can decide, they can look at all the data, go through a whole range of queries and then decide what it is that they want to do and who they want to target. Um, and one of the things that we have to be really careful of because we absolutely promised that we wouldn't bombard people with emails um, we decided uh, relatively early on that most of the um, most of the campaigns that we're going to be doing will be using email, and at a later date we'll do more mobile um, and potentially for some segments even snail mail campaigns. But we had to uh, establish a clash diary because NGCB already have their own mutual mailing that they do sometimes, and um, and also they're all very busy doing their own marketing campaigns. But it's very important that we don't overmail people. And as I said, we have rich segment insight. Now, that's related exactly to the people who are in the insider. I won't go into too much detail, but we um, basically each organisation had to come up with a kind of campaign that they wanted to run. So each does a series of campaigns, and we had had a bit of delay in the technical development, how unsurprising that a technical project might have some delays because of development. Uh, so when I last came here, we thought that we would have pretty much all of the data from the first two rounds of campaigns to um, report on, but we've actually just got to the point where we've finished our first series of campaigns. What was quite interesting in terms of the, some of the organisations chose quite transactional things to test. So they wanted to test whether uh, people were more engaged by a free glass of wine or five pounds off. And so what we had to do was really encourage people to think of um, things that might bring them closer, bring audiences closer to their organisation, something that might engage them more. So a behind the scenes tour or uh, a talk with the artistic director beforehand or a talk with the, um, with the curator or um, the cast afterwards. Um, and every, everything that we do is a test. So even when we sent our invites out to invite people to come to the Insider, we did A, B, and C, D tests. So we were testing not only the copy that we used, um, but also really simple things like the subject headlines. Everything that we do basically has to be a test and then be evaluated. And we're going to write that all up as case studies. Uh, there's also um, two projects in New Zealand that are doing a similar thing but on a slightly different model. So there's one in Auckland, New Zealand, and their model is that they all share one venue and that one venue has one CRM, uh, patron base, which some of you will be familiar with. So it's all about what happens in that venue for all of those organisations. So actually their insight uh, is going to be really rich. So this is what we were hoping the impacts would be. More engaged audiences, uh, increased capability in the organisations, a working shared database that they can use on a daily basis, clean and augmented data, and segmentation of their audience. And obviously a better understanding because of that. And as I said, for the art sector, as part of the project, everything that we do pretty much has to be open source, as it were. And then we've got the case studies, which we're just starting to write. So, um, just how are we doing on time? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes, great. So I'll just start to give you uh, some of the numbers of where, where we're starting to do some analysis at the end of the first campaign. So one of the most surprising factors, and we talked about this last time, but actually now that there are more people in the Insider, um, we've got uh, more data. There's actually, when we looked at the data that had been cleaned and augmented, there's only 20% crossover across the nine organisations. So that means that there's only 20% of the 
of people are on more than one database, which was a real shock to those organisations, because I think they thought it would be, and we all thought it would be much, much higher. Despite the fact that it's a shock, it's an amazing opportunity, because it means that now what they could see, uh, we've been talking about all of this and the theory of how we're going to do it and what we're going to do for more than 12 months. And once they realised this, they could see that actually being able to access um, the data from other organisations when the crossover is so incredibly low was just a massive opportunity for them. Um, so that was really exciting uh, for the project. So in the end, we invited nearly 180,000 people in the northwest to join the Insider. And at the moment, we currently have 14,500 members. So those are people who we've invited and who said, that sounds great. They've, um, they've joined up and they've answered the big long survey, so we have, we, we have profile information for that many people. At the moment, we've only sent out one series of invitations, and we'll be sending out more. What we would really like to be is about 30,000 people in the Insider. Um, just when you're sending out your email campaigns, what's your kind of click-through rate? What are you getting in terms of conversion? 28, yeah, great. Okay. So this isn't click-through rate, but I'll come back to click-through rates in a moment. But in terms of conversion, it's an 8% conversion rate. So they didn't just click through, but they went through a really, really long survey. I shouldn't be saying that it was really long, but it was quite long. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So 8% conversion rate is really very high, and we were absolutely thrilled with that. Because quite often, if you have to go through a sign-up process, the conversion rate can be anywhere around 2 or 3%. So we were really <coughs> stoked with that. Um, as I said, we're testing absolutely everything. So when we sent out the invites to um, nearly 180,000 people, we did an A-B test on which, we did it for 10,000 first actually, uh, on which um, subject title um, would attract most people. And what we found out was that very special invitation in close was much more compelling. So when we sent out to the rest, we sent that out to them to try and encourage them. Uh, for greater open rates. So this is some insight into the culture segment profile of the people in the Insider. And what you can see here is there's a really, really large percentage of expression of stimulation and essence. It's really great to have this many expression in the audience. As I mentioned before, they're people who like to spread the word and tell other people about things. I'll just show you what that looks like uh, against the the segment profile of the Northeast and the UK overall, so you can see it's really quite different. Oh, I won't go into too much detail about that. Mm -hmm. um, and we also looked at the levels of engagement. So as I mentioned before, you can see now, some of you at the back might not be able to see, um, but we've got at this end here, at the highly engaged end, that 6% of the people in the Insider um, were prepared to give up their time and 1% of their money and 54% are confident explorers. And what we would hope is that we'd move people who are down this end of the spectrum further up to this end and that's going to be one of our measures of success. Here's some, can, anyone, can you see that at the back? Okay, just, yes, yeah, sorry, it's a little bit light. What this is is uh, a model of the art forms and the dark purple here is those people in the Insider who have, who have engaged in their art form ever. And then the lighter lilac is those who have never engaged but would be interested in engaging. So for the, for the organisations, they can look at the art forms and think, this is the potential future market for us. So for example, 32% um, uh, had never been to um, an archival local history organisation, but they would be really interested in it. Uh, not surprisingly, only 2% have never been to the cinema and would be interested, but basically, this is the potential market for each art form. And then this is the same breakdown, but for each organisation. So basically, the organisations can look at this and they can see what their future potential is. Um, and just to pull out one particular one, so this is Hatton Gallery, and 51% of the people in the Insider said, we've never been to your organisation, but we'd be really interested in going. 
So it's a really great way for them to look at this and then to start to think about, well, how am I going to engage those people um, in the insider? And this is also really valuable for each organisation just to see where they sat uh, compared to each other. <coughs> we're all very interested in that. So uh, this is one of the campaigns that was sent out by Dance City. And Dance City did a really interesting campaign. They decided that what they wanted to do was target people who had never been to dance. Uh, so never been to dance, but also never been to Dance City. And so they did a really beautiful and very boutique thing. And their chief executive wrote and invited people to come um, to have uh, a drink with him and a pre-show talk. So they thought, okay, what are the barriers for people who have never been to dance before? What are the things that are going to make them really uncomfortable? And they tried to then basically address each of those barriers. So a personal invitation from the chief executive, uh, a talk with him before to explain what was going to happen and how it would all work. Uh, when they were optimising for segments with one of the segments, what they did uh, is they said, for expression, who really like social things, they really emphasise the social aspect and they said you will meet other people from the insider, um, hoping that that would really engage them. So they optimised for two different segments, just testing copy and title, but they crafted their offer really, really carefully. Uh, and then they also had a post-show um, chat with them afterwards. Um, and just in terms of the, so we're just really looking at the absolute early results. Uh, and in terms of, um, because they were testing like, subject line and copy, um, in one sort of, I'll just give you a random instance. Um, in one segment they had a 24% open rate to one version and a 31% open rate to another. So the one that they had optimised for that particular segment had a, um, there was a 29% <coughs> increase in open rate. So they could see that by working really hard to try and target the segments, understanding what they knew from Culture Segments Insight, they had a much better open rate. And you might think that's a really, really small difference, but um, basically what it means is that for every 100 people who received that email, seven extra people opened it. And when you're thinking about your databases and sending out tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, that actually can be quite significant. So it's a very, very small learning uh, from what they did. Um, but the feedback that they got from the people who came to the event was really phenomenal. Uh, so sorry for the long quote, but basically they said that the people who came, they only got a small number of people, but that's all they were really aiming for. So these are people who've never been to their venue, never been to dance. They were really engaged, they had a really positive and personal experience, and they came away feeling that Dance City had done a really great thing for them. So they felt that the feedback on the night was extremely positive, and while it was quite a lot of work for them to organise a special event, they felt it was really worth it, because um, to get people along who had never been before and who came away really glowing at the dance experience that they had, they felt like that was some, uh, something that they'd really like to do again. So that's really fantastic. Um, the other example I'm going to talk to you about is something that um, the Baltic did. So um, they had an exhibition on, and they decided that they wanted to focus on targeting expression, stimulation, and release. And their hypothesis, or the thing that they were testing, was whether when they were optimizing their copy, or when they were optimizing their event, whether they focused on the social element, they were going to have uh, a curator's talk where there was wine, whether the social element was the thing that would engage people, or whether it was the actual art, like the expertise, having a subject matter expert explain things to you. And so they were testing title and copy. Um, and every, every single campaign has to have each of these things um, answered. And so for the social element, they focused on stimulation. Stimulation love to find out about things first. They really love things that are new. They'll try all sorts of things. They're really highly engaged in the arts. They too will bring lots of people along. They love trying things that are new and different. And as I said before, they love to be the first to know about things. They really love things that have got a social aspect. So they were targeting them for the social element. Um, and they really strongly focused on the fact that there'd be wine, that you'd get to meet other members of the insider. 
um, which they hadn't had a chance to do before. And then uh, the second uh, piece of copy really focused on the fact that it was an absolute expert who was giving the talk. It was really about the art, and it was the curator who was giving the talk. Um, and the results of that were that... Um, so really interestingly, uh, the social aspect worked incredibly well for stimulation. They loved it. And what they found is that the kind of art focus really worked well for expression and release. What they had thought is that expression, who also really like social things, they thought that side of things would really engage them. But they found that actually, in the end, the art focus trumped the social side of things for expression. What happened is they decided that they would make it quite boutique and that they would have a really limited number of tickets to this event. Um, and the response was phenomenal. They sold, well, they sold out that. It was, it was a free event um, with the curator and some wine and other members of the Insider. But they sold out in 20 minutes, and they actually got loads and loads of people of the pub, from the public ringing up because they had to get their ticket through Eventbrite. And they were like, oh, Eventbrite's broken. I can't kind of get into it. What's the problem? So in actual fact, they had another event, not dissimilar, that was part of their normal programming. Um, and they, in the end, they got lots of the people who came through the Insider to go to that event. And what was really interesting is that's like a really great control group. That event, they focused um, not at all on the social aspects. They really focused on um, the fact that it was an expert and they didn't optimise it for any particular segment. In fact, it wasn't the, the content and the invite was not written by their team, it was written by the events team. And um, they had 100 places for that and they had 20 for the other one. And they were really struggling to get anybody along to the event. They hadn't optimised it using segmentation and people just weren't, weren't as engaged. So, um, so they found it incredibly useful. Although, interestingly, when they looked at their optimization, they got it really right sometimes and not quite so right uh, the other times. More interesting to me, um, the project has really given Baltic, the communications team, a lot of confidence. Quite often, their uh, email marketing content is written by their events team or by somebody else. And that, that what they've said is that the big learning for them is that now they want to basically write all their copies so that they can optimize it. Uh, for each segment, and that now I'm also realising that they need to be not just thinking about their marketing and their audience development strategies, but also actually their product. So actually crafting events, particularly for certain segments in the audience, to try and engage them. So those are the very, very, very early learnings, and there are something like ten more campaigns to um, to analyse this week, and in a couple of months we'll have more than twenty campaigns, and we'll have a lot more detail. But that just gives you a little bit of an idea of where we've got to. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, we did one or two questions. 